The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Welcome to Grace in Focus from the Grace Evangelical Society. So glad that you are with us as today we are in a question and answer format. And today's question is about teachers and mainly about what should a teacher's disposition be? How confident should a teacher of Scripture be? What happens when the Scripture does not seem to be clear? Is skepticism or speculation ever okay? Let me just mention that our website, if you want to know more about us, is faithalone.org. faithalone.org. You'll find all of our books there, along with articles, videos, and the opportunity to subscribe to our subscription-free magazine, Grace in Focus. Also, don't forget our national conference coming up May the 22nd through the 25th. Find out more about it all at faithalone.org. Now here is today's question, answer, and discussion. Hey, Bob, uh, we're uh, back here, and I got a good question from Tim. He goes, I was recently approached by a church elder telling me not to teach Sunday school class with so much certainty or confidence that I have a correct understanding of a particular passage. And he goes on to say that there are some things that are absolutely clear in Scripture, such as saved by faith alone, but there's also many passages that are controversial, and we shouldn't take the attitude that we know the answer. That's what the elder was saying. Yes. And so here's the question. Is it wrong to teach, and I'm going to use his word, controversial Bible passages with certainty. You know, I think we often teach controversial passages with great confidence or certainty. One of the things that attracted me to Zane Hodges is that when I would hear him answer questions, he answered with such conviction. It was clear that he was certain he was right. Even if it was a very difficult passage, and even if I wasn't yet convinced, I found myself being impressed by the way in which he explained the answer, because he not only was convincing in the arguments he made based on observations from the text, but he was also convincing by his attitude. It wasn't hubris. It wasn't like he was proud or arrogant or anything. It was just to him, this was obvious. It would be like some small child asking, how do you know 16 times 3 is 48? I mean, you're not going to go into a big, long controversy over it because you know that 16 times 3 is 48. And you could explain it lots of different ways. But the point is, you're not going to be going, wow, I wonder if I should act like I'm sure it's 48. Maybe it's 42. (laughs) No, some of these controversial passages are only controversial because people haven't studied them. One of the issues that comes into play on this question is the Bible never contradicts itself. Right. You know, and so sometimes people will say, well, this is a controversial passage. You can't be dogmatic. For example, you'll know them by their fruits. Okay? Right. So they'll say, well, I, I think it means if you don't have good works, you're really not saved. Or if you don't have enough good works, you're going to go to hell. And that's just as valid as any other And no, we can be dogmatic that even if there's a passage that has more than one way we can look at it in context, we can be dogmatic and say, I know it's not teaching that. Yes, I agree. And let me give you an anecdote from my past. I came to faith in Christ during my senior year in college through Athletes in Action, a branch of Campus Crusade for Christ. And I became a student leader. And the next year, I was in grad school. A student who was in the master's program in Latin at UC Irvine had graduated the previous year from Talbot. He had both an MDiv and a THM from Talbot in New Testament. And he was teaching a Bible study in the graduate student housing, so I went to his Bible study. And one day I came to him and I said, Don, I don't understand. You're always saying... This verse has four different possible interpretations, A, B, C, D. Here's the probabilities of each one, and I lean towards C, but I don't really know which one it is. Then he comes to the next passage, same thing. Next passage, same thing. And I said, Don, why don't you just tell us what it says? And he said, in a condescending sort of way, Bob, you haven't been to seminary yet, but if you ever go, you'll know. We don't know with certainty what these texts say. 
all we know is probabilities. So I can lay out to you the different views and which views are more and less probable. But as far as what they actually mean, we just don't know. And I remember when I heard that, and I was a one-year-old believer, and I thought, that's malarkey. (laughs) Obviously, we can know what the Bible says. Now, there are hard verses of the Bible. I get that. But to say that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, do we have to have doubts about that? No, right. Do we have to have doubts about that Jesus is God? Or do we need to have doubts about the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins or he rose bodily from the dead? No. There's thousands of things in the Bible that are just crystal clear. Now, admittedly, like Peter says, there are some things in Paul that are hard to understand. And the same thing is true with other passages in the Bible. There are hard passages, but lots of them are crystal clear. I like to think of it this way. And so for Tim, I would say on aspects of Scripture that are clear, well, you should be extremely confident as to what it teaches. I just want to jump in there for a second. I think another part of the problem here is this leader in his church probably thinks there's a lot more controversial passages than there are. Right. You know, like, okay, there's a controversy about that passage. But like you were talking about the guy when you were in college, after you became a believer, he saw basically every verse controversial. He every did. verse got like eight or nine different interpretations. And that's not exactly. the case. Exactly. There's a lot of verses that we can say, no, I see what's going on here. Like Mark eight thirty four through 38 is not telling people how to go to heaven. It's talking about discipleship. That's deny yourself, take up your cross right. and follow me and right. saving and losing your life. Right. And-, and so people will say, well, there's eight or nine different options there. No, that's talking about discipleship. We can get in there and talk some of the details on here, but that's not a controversial passage in the sense that, okay, in order for me to be in the kingdom, I've got to take up my cross and deny myself and give up my life. Yeah, I like your point. Most of Scripture is clear. Right. But the second thing I think that's important is to recognize something you've already said. Even if something is not clear, we can rule out certain interpretations, right? right? So we can always say, no, Emmett, there are, like to use my friend Don as an example, I can say there are nine different interpretations that I know of of 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God sins. And we can eliminate some of those nine as being impossible. And we could be dogmatic about it. Yeah. We could say it, it does not mean this. Right. Some of those nine, we can say several of those are quite possible. So let's say we're at a passage and one of the interpretations is Jesus is not God. Well, we can rule that one out. Right. If one of the interpretations is the Bible is in error, we can rule that out. And if we come to some interpretation that says a person has everlasting life by works, they escape eternal condemnation by works, we can rule that out. We need to always be careful that we, A, are free to say much of Scripture is clear, B, that even the some of the stuff that's unclear, we can rule out certain views. And the other thing is, I think we should be honest, and I would encourage Tim in this way, if you're speculating, admit it. For example, one of the things that we've speculated on before is maybe there will be children born in eternity on the new earth, because maybe at the end of the millennium, people will be somehow sealed in such a way that they're made like they would have been in the Garden of Eden, so that their children do not inherit a sin nature. So their children are born innocent and their children go into the new earth with bodies. Well, with natural bodies and the kingdom ever gets bigger and bigger. There are some verses that seem to support that. Absolutely. Right. But but that is speculation. Right. And we say it. And so I would encourage Tim, if you're speculating, say you're speculating. And if the scriptures aren't clear, say that. I will sometimes say, yeah, there are three different views of this passage And I lean toward this one, but I'm really not sure. But I don't do that too often. I like what you said about Zane. Uh, I didn't know him as well as you did. But I do think that there is a fear among many Bible teachers that, well, I can't be dogmatic about this. And again, there's an awful lot of things we can be dogmatic about in the scriptures. I remember I asked Zane one day, if there was some verse that taught we could lose everlasting life, would you believe it? And he said, yes. And he said, but I know there's no such verse. And I said, how do you know that? 
And he says, because I've studied every verse in the Bible, and there isn't such a verse. <laughs> right. <laughs> there is none. So he could be dogmatic. And he <laughs> said on top of that, there couldn't be, because there are hundreds that are clear that once you're saved, you're always saved. Right. And since Scripture can't contradict itself, I know there are no such verses. I mean, isn't it possible to express your view in such a way that people understand you're absolutely convinced this is true? There's no doubt about it. But on the other hand, you're not kind of rubbing their noses in it. You're not kind of acting like I'm smarter than you are or I'm better than you are. Isn't it possible to just say, this is what the scriptures teach? Yes, this is, the Lord says this, you know, and the Lord says it and... That settles uh, it. That settles it. If I was teaching let's say, history. And so I was trying to talk about the history of George Washington. If there were aspects of his life that were in doubt, I would say so. But much of his life is not in doubt. And so I wouldn't teach it like, well, I don't know for sure, but I think he was the first president. (laughs) I don't know for sure, but I think he had wooden teeth. Or I don't know for sure, but... You know, I heard he was at Valley Forge, (laughs) whatever it is. And the same way with the Bible. It's false humility to act like we don't know what the text says. Right. We don't need to be filled with hubris and pride when we teach the word. We're just teaching the truth in love. As long as Tim is not acting like he's better than everybody else or that he knows more than everybody else, it's fine to teach with conviction. And it's great to do it because it's like, thus saith the Lord. You know, the Lord has said this. And by the way, that's died out. Right. People don't do that much anymore. And that's certainly our postmodern age. Part of that. Part of that is. I agree. You know, there's, there's no such thing as true, so I can't be dogmatic. So, Tim, I'd say keep preaching the word. Keep teaching the word. Teach it in a humble way. But you don't have to apologize for being certain. And a good part of being sure of what the scripture says is keep Keep grace in focus. Thank you both for that informative discussion. Our goal at the Grace Evangelical Society is to teach scripture clearly and without confusion. One of the best tools for that clarity, we believe, is our website. It's faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On our site, we have all kinds of materials that are designed to help you mature and grow in your faith and your understanding of Scripture. Please come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. You'll be glad you did. God loves a cheerful giver, and that's why we think our financial partners are some of the happiest people in the world. If you would like to learn how to become a financial partner with Grace in Focus, we would very much appreciate it. Learn more at faithalone.org. It's really exciting to hear from our listeners. So if you've got a question, comment, or feedback, I hope you'll reach out to us. Best way to do that is through email. Here is our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next Grace in Focus and all next week, we're going to be looking at that small book, that minor prophet. His name is Habakkuk, and we hope you'll join us. This is the Grace Evangelical Society. Until next time, let's keep grace in focus. The preceding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.